Hi, this is Dan Heisman, Philly Tutor for Chess FM, and this is the Improve Your Chess video series for ICC members. In the past several years, we've had a format where most of the videos, although not uh, almost all, were about games played, and most of those were amateur games. We did have games that I played that were famous Grandmaster games. We also had a series of opening tabias. We had things on end games, thought process. We, we were all over the map, basically covering videos on all parts of chess improvement. And now we've decided that we would make a puzzle-oriented approach to see how the readers liked something new. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a series of videos on puzzles. And I've been asked to pr primarily concentrate on puzzles that would be called middle game puzzles, meaning we're not going to talk about you know, how to play the opening. We're not going to talk about, you know, how to mate with a king and a rook or anything. We're going to have puzzles that have more pieces on the board and not just in the opening stage. So one of the things I suggested was I thought it would be kind of boring if all the puzzles were just the kind you could do in a book. So if you picked up a white to play and win book where you're trying to win material or checkmate, uh, to do all puzzles like that, uh, would be kind of usurping what you could do at home. But we do want to do some of the puzzles like that because if we do none, then you're not learning one of the main things you do in games, which is how to find you know, possible winning continuations. So I thought we would mix up the type of puzzles that we would do. And we would have some white to play and win, some white to play and mates. But we'd also have, you know, what's the best move in this kind of situation? Uh, one of the ones that I based on my old book I shouldn't call it an old book. It's my most recent book called Is Your Move Safe? Where we have a puzzle and we ask you, if you play a move, is it safe? In other words, can the opponent play a tactic after that move that would win material or checkmate? Then there are planning puzzles. Um, for instance, Jeff uh, Grand, Grandmaster Chris Ward has a series called It's Your Move. And I thought some puzzles from that book would be good too. So if we do take a, a puzzle out of a book, of course, I'm going to give that book you know, credit for the puzzle. And finally, I thought maybe one puzzle per video would be on a board vision puzzle, maybe a puzzle that doesn't use the regular ideas of play and win or something, but they ask you to do something on a board that helps you improve how you look at a board. I've had people argue with me and say, well, if it's not something that can occur in a game, I'm not interested. And the answer is, well, if you're trying to get better at chess, then anything that's going to make your board vision better or make you understand how the pieces work together better is going to be helpful. It would be sort of like saying, I'm a football player, and since there's no weights on a football field, I'm never going to lift any weights because on a football field, I'm, I'm, I'm hitting people and stuff, and you know, lifting weights isn't going to happen. Well, just like lifting weights can make you stronger, which will make you a better football player, doing board vision puzzles, even ones that are, have a little bit unusual requirements, can make you a better chess player too. All right, so for today, I thought we'd start with puzzles that were relatively easy. It is the first video of this type. When we're doing our puzzles, what you can do is once you find out what the requirement for the puzzle is, whether it's white to play and win, or what's the best move, or is this move safe, or whatever, you can stop the video, hit the pause button, and then try to find you know, the answer to the puzzle, and then you can come back and see how I talk about it. I mean, there's no sense in me giving you the puzzle and then having five minutes of uh, twiddling my thumbs while the video is running while you're trying to solve the puzzle. So you're going to be using the pause button a lot uh, during our puzzle videos. All right, having said all that, let's get to our first puzzle. And the first puzzle is going to be a fairly traditional one. And I got it out of the book, um, John Bain's Chess Tactics for Students, which I like to recommend to my, uh, to my students. And there's other books that are very similar that are good. All right, so this is black to play and win. So if you want to stop the video, you're going to be looking for black to play and win. Now, for those of you who don't know what win means, a lot of times when I teach people that have never played a lot and they, they haven't done a lot of puzzles, they think win means checkmate. Well, win usually means win enough material that if both sides played perfectly, you would get to a winning position, which may include checkmate, but it doesn't require checkmate. And usually it's not. Usually it's the win of material. So keeping that in mind, this puzzle is black to play and win. And again, if you'd like to pause it, good idea, and we'll come back. All right, so when you're doing these puzzles, how do you solve them? Well, you look for what's called seeds of tactical destruction. 
things that you could do to the opponent that or things in your opponent's position that would tell you that there might be a tactic. So let's look at if it's black to play and win, we're looking at problems for white. Well, right now white's up a pawn, but he's behind in development, which is a seed in itself. And black has the bishop pair, which means he has two bishops and white doesn't. All right, so what could black do? What, what's, what's wrong with white's position? Well, we see maybe his king might be a little weak. G2 and H2 are undefended. Uh, that's an idea. And we see his pieces aren't out very much. It doesn't look like you can trap his queen or his knight or anything. But here's a big seed right here. We see that the rook and the queen are on the same diagonal. When you see a rook and a queen on the same diagonal, you're either looking to, you know, pin the the rook to the queen or skewer the queen to the rook, possibly with a light squared bishop. And you're also maybe possibly having some possi some ideas with maybe with the black queen. All right, so here, the, the move that immediately we, we'd like to play is bishop a6. But if you're one of those players who said, gee, I can't play bishop a6 because if the queen takes the bishop, he just wins my bishop, so that's no good. We call that a quiescence error because what you're trying to do is make this work. And what I found from teaching a lot of people is when they have these positions in games, they don't see moves like bishop a6 very much because they see it as being unsafe. But when they have a puzzle and they know there's something there, then they push further and they say, well, well, how can I make bishop a6 work? Which is what they should do during a game, too. And the answer here is actually pretty easy. That's why it's in the Bain book, which is not an advanced book. If you play bishop a6 and white tries to take the bishop, which isn't his best move, then black has bishop takes h2 check, which is a discovered attack on the queen on a6. And after king takes h2, black plays queen takes a6. And when the smoke clears here, Black now has a queen for a knight and a bishop, which is a winning advantage. So after bishop a6, queen takes a6 doesn't work. But what else can white do after bishop a6? He could just save the queen, move the queen to a safe square, let's say b3 or something. But then after bishop takes f3 and king, sorry, bishop takes f1 and king takes f1, black has won the exchange. Now, what's interesting is black didn't win as much as it really looked like he won. Um, he started out with the bishop pair for a pawn, so he's down half a pawn. And here he won a rook for a bishop, which is about one and three quarters pawns. But he had to give up the bishop pair. So he gained one and a quarter pawns. Well, one and a quarter pawns is um, a nice gain, but he was already down a pawn. So if we look at the position now, he's up the exchange for a pawn. So the position isn't all that terrible for white. Now, of course, black here can play bishop takes h2 and get another pawn. So maybe when we're looking at this position, we should look at ways that white could try to play to save the h2 pawn. And of course, it, it doesn't look like he's got a lot like that. I think the computer says here, let's bring in the computer and take his analysis a little bit. Um, we'll move the board up a little bit for this so you can see it. Well, the computer suggests queen c6. And now if bishop takes f1 and king takes f1, the computer doesn't like bishop h2 anymore because white can trade queens and then trap the bishop with g3. So what the computer suggests after bishop a6, queen c6, believe it or not, as you can see, the computer doesn't even think that bishop takes f1 is the best move. Now that's the answer to the puzzle in the book is bishop takes f1 and wins the exchange. Here the computer thinks that bishop e5, because black's ahead in development, is just as good, for instance, after queen takes, bishop takes. Suppose the rook tries to save itself and plays rook to d1, but now he's in a pin on the d file and c5 will, will win even more. If he plays rook to e1, then black can simply play bishop takes d4 and the rook can't go. So there's, so in this position, there's no way to save the rook anyway. And black has pressure on the knight and he's still ahead in development. If the knight moves, that would let black take the rook and then maybe bring the rook down. So this actually is, the computer thinks is as good or better as the solution in the book. And that happens sometimes. That's why I check books, especially books that were originally written, you know, several years ago against the computer just to see if their answer is the best one. 
Grandmaster John Nunn has noted that if you don't do that and there's more than one good move that wins the game, then it's kind of not fair to the reader to have multiple ways to win. All right, let's get to our second puzzle. Um, actually, it's a good idea to keep this up for a second so I can paste this in. All right, so we're going to take a puzzle from my book, Is It Safe? In this book, I give positions and then I give candidate moves and I ask, are those candidate moves safe? So in this position, I only ask about one candidate move. And again, we're going to ask you to pause once I say what that is and figure out if that move is safe. In other words, if you make that move, does your opponent have a way to win material or checkmate you? And the answer, the, answer, the question is, is the move knight to e5 safe? So in this puzzle, is it safe? Is knight to e5 safe? And again, you can pause the video to try to figure it out. All right, so we're looking to see whether the move 95 is safe. Suppose you're one of those people that says, well, 95 is safe. Um, he has that square attacked once and it's guarded once. So if knight takes rook takes, it's safe. All right, well, that's, as they say in mathematics, that's necessary, but it's not sufficient to answer the question because maybe 95 unguards something else or maybe after knight takes rook takes the black has a further continuation that would make things unsafe so you have to ask yourself all those questions because if you make a move and your opponent plays a forcing sequence that wins material just because you didn't see far enough doesn't mean that the move was safe so let's let's do the answer without moving the pieces on the board so that um you can work on your visualization, which is what you should do when you're doing a puzzle. You shouldn't set it up. You should set it up on the board, but you shouldn't move the pieces till the end to make sure you're checking to see if you're right. So here we're looking at knight e5. Well, it turns out that the best idea for black to try to win material is to play knight takes e5. And of course, for white to recapture, he has to play rook takes e5. And now after rook takes e5, if you visualize that position correctly, which isn't that far from the current position, the rook on e5 is loose meaning it's not guarded, and the knight on f4 is loose. Well, that again suggests that maybe we can attack the two on the diagonal or maybe with a queen along a diagonal and along a, a file, and there is no dark squared bishop to, to play bishop to d6 or anything, but black can play the move queen to d4, and queen d4 not only hits the pawn on b2, but it hits the rook on e5 and it hits the knight on f4. Well, what are all the squares where the knight can go to guard a rook on e5, the knight on f4? Well, it can go to d3 or g6, but d3 has a white piece on it, so it can't go there. And g6, black can just play f takes g6, so the knight can't guard the rook. But what are all the squares where the rook can guard the knight? Well, a rook on e5 can guard a knight on f4 by playing rook f5 or playing rook e4. The problem with rook e4, of course, is knight takes e4 winning the exchange, and he can't play rook f5 because of e takes f5. So we have to look for, for other attacks, uh, other possibilities for white to save those pieces. Does he have a counterattack like queen to g4 or something? No. Can he, can he guard the rook and trap the queen somehow by playing queen e2, queen f4, and then g3 or something? No, that doesn't work. Um, can he guard the knight and then trap the queen that takes the rook? No, he can't do that either. So it turns out that knight e5 is not safe because of the continuation. Knight takes e5, rook takes e5, queen d4 with a double attack, and white has no good answer to that. So now that we've gone through it with visualizing, let's do it on the board. And of course, in a game, you have to visualize it because if you wait till it happens on the board, it's too late. So queen d4, you know, this move was, the seeds of tactical destruction called for a move like this. It, we were looking for moves that would hit these loose pieces simultaneously in some way. And now we can see that, you know, rook e4 doesn't work because of knight takes e4. Rook f5 doesn't work because pawn takes. Knight g6 doesn't work because f takes. Knight d3 is impossible. Queen e2 allows queen takes f4 and the queen is not trapped after g3. For instance, he could play queen d4 again or something like that. Um, if he plays queen f3 and he takes the rook. White has no way to punish that either. So white is losing material here. What does that tell white? Well, it tells white if he's playing 
real chess and not hope chess, that if he plays knight e5 and he looks at all the checks, captures, and threats for black, and he looks at the sequences, he should be able to see that knight e5 is not safe, and therefore he has to eliminate knight e5 as a candidate move and find a different move to play here that, that might be better. So knight e5, not safe. All right, let's go to our next puzzle. All right, in this puzzle, it's from Chris Ward's book, Is It's Your Move, and it's puzzle four, number three. And what he does is he gives you five plans and you have to pick out the right one. So we'll call those plans A, B, C, D. He actually gives them names like Amy and Bill, but we'll just do A, B, C, D, E. I'll read you the five plans and then you can pause the video and see which one you think is correct. So plan A, yes, the black queen is offside and in serious danger. Black should play D6 and with the coincidentally challenging E5, he will have secured a return for it along the H3 to D7 diagonal. Plan B is white will regret having a pawn on g3. The black queen is already in green on the white king side. A plan of h5 intending h4 to activate the rook should really do some damage. Plan C, hardly a cheeky or sneaky suggestion from C this time. Observing that white is preparing to play bishop a3, he now wants to play castle first. Following this, he will be organized on the queen side by ultimately arranging a break with his b-pawn. D. D suggests that white's doubled c-pawns are a weakness and the one on c4 is the most vulnerable. D can't decide if she would rather win it or make the square an outpost. Bishop a6 is her preference with knight a5 and even possibly d5 to follow. Plan E, completing development is a priority for E. He wants to castle whichever side is allowed very soon, but before that comes the obvious bishop to b7. He has highlighted the white f3 pawn as a big target. All right, so again, only one of those five, according to the Grandmaster who wrote the book, is the correct idea. So is it to play d6 and then e5, making sure your queen has a safe retreat? Is it the plan of playing h5, h4, and trying to take advantage of the weakness on g3? Is it to play castle kingside immediately, followed by a queenside break, possibly with the b-pawn? Is it bishop a6 followed by knight a5 and maybe d5? Or is it just bishop to b7? All right, those are the five plans. Which one is the correct plan? All right, let's look at uh, the solution of the Grandmaster, and then we can even check to see what the computer says. All right, so Grandmaster, this is puzzle 4-3. So at the back of the book, we're going to go to 4-3. And he says, this is from my own game. And in this position, after queen e2, he played bishop a6, bishop a3, castle queen side, f4, d5, castle queen side, knight a5, c5, bishop takes c3, Rook takes c3, knight c4. Black has a fantastic outpost for the knight, providing a stark contrast with white's bad bishop. All right, so obviously black's way better here. Um, and if we do analysis on this position, Stockfish 8 says black is completely winning. But was he winning all the way back at the start? And was did the computer think bishop a6 was the best move? Well, let's see here. Ah, well, we can see white obviously made some mistakes. It, it does say that the correct answer is D, the famous way of playing against white's doubled pawns in the Nimzo Indian with bishop a6 and knight a5 and d5 or c5. But it also says black's only up about two or three tenths of a pawn if white plays perfectly. So, so obviously white didn't play the best in the sequence that happened in the Grandmaster's game. Right now he says, Bishop a6 minus 0.25, but he's jumping all around, minus 0.17, minus 0.13. So black has a slight advantage, but that's the right answer. So again, our answer is D for that. All right, let's do our final puzzle. Enlarge the board again. Stop and chat, and we'll paste in. All right, now this one is a board vision puzzle. 
This is from Jeff Coakley's book, Winning Chess Puzzles for Kids, Volume 2, which is one of the best board vision books I know. And this puzzle is what Jeff calls a double whammy. Now, whenever I explain double whammies to people, since they have an unusual requirement, I try to tell them it in two different ways. I try to say it in a way that would be in a normal chess game. And then I also try to say it the way Jeff prefers it, which I think is is easier, although it's not the, the normal way of looking at it from a chess game. From a normal chess game standpoint, the question would be, white to play a move that's not check that threatens mate in one. So let's say that again. White to find a move that is not check that threatens mate in one. Now the way Jeff explains it, I like better, which is simply white gets two moves in a row. Black gets no moves at all. And white has to checkmate black in two moves, but the first move can't be check. Now, if you think about it, those two requirements are exactly the same. The requirement that you make a move that threatens mate in one that's not a check, or you can get two moves in a row to mate him where the first move is not a check is exactly the same thing. All right, so that's what this puzzle is. This is white to play, and either think of it as make a move that threatens mate in one that's not a check, or you get two moves in a row to checkmate him where the first move is not a check. Any way you want to look at it, they're exactly the same, but that's the puzzle, and you have to find the answer. All right, again, if you want to stop the video and see if you can find the answer, go ahead. All right, well, when I do these two move in a row puzzles, one of the things I try to do is say, suppose I could just put my queen on any square of the board here. Would there be a checkmate? Well, as it turns out, it's not so. If the queen could go to a8, that's not mate because what black can interpose. Same thing with b8. If the queen can go to c8, which he can in one move, that's not checkmate. Black can just take. If the queen can get to d8 in two moves, the king and the bishop could take. f8, the rook can take. g8, the queen can take. And h8, um, the rook on f1 can go in the way. So getting the queen to any of those squares in two moves is not going to solve the problem. But the only other mating square is e7, and the bishop and the rook are guarding that. So make, making two queen moves in a row is not going to be the right answer. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us either the first queen move would have to be a capture, or we'd have to make a queen move and then a rook move, or have to make a rook move and then a queen move. But it's not going to be just queen here, then queen here, checkmate. Well, there's only, other one one, only one other possibility for two queen moves, and that's to take the rook first and then try to come down and get some sort of mate, but that doesn't work either. So now we know it's either a queen move followed by a rook move or a rook move followed by a queen move. Well, if we do make a queen move, could we set up some sort of back rank mate? Could we play queen h7 and then play rook a8? No, that's not going to work for the exact same reasons as before. There's always interpositions. <clears throat> So it doesn't look really look like a queen move followed by a rook move is going to work. How about a rook move followed by a queen move? Well, what good is that? Well, it actually has some goodness to it. And that is, maybe we can move the rook away from the left side of the board so the queen can come up and get an extra checkmate. Well, moving all the way over doesn't work because when we check with the queen on d7 or c8, the king can go to f8, but that's the point. We don't want the king to go to f8, so the move we want to look at is rook to f7. Now, obviously, if this was a game, that would be a terrible move. But the question is, does it satisfy the requirement? Does it threaten mate in one? And the answer is yes. Rook f7 is the only move on the board that's not a check that threatens mate in one because white is threatening queen d7 checkmate. So that must be the answer to the problem. So the answer to the problem is rook f7. Again, a terrible move in a chess game, but a, a hard move to find visually to satisfy this requirement. And now if white gets two moves in a row, he gets his checkmate. Or if he doesn't get two moves in a row, we could say it's the only move that threatens mate in one. And it does. All right. And doing these kind of problems, I can't stress this strongly enough, even though in a real game you wouldn't be looking for a move like rook f7, to see that that's the only move that threatens mate helps your tactical vision, helps your board vision, helps you become a better player when you do drills like this. All right. So if we were looking for white's best move here, well, that's a whole different story. You know, that's, 
let's ask the computer. Let the white is down a rook and a bishop. He'd probably be pretty happy if he could even get a draw out of this. Can he? The computer says, yes, he can. He can win. Queen checks. King f8. Rook a8 check. And now notice all the inner positions are bad. So queen c8 takes. Bishop here takes. Rook here, here. So if, we, if this was white to play and win, the answer would be, sure, just check him over here. And even though there is no mate on the next move, now you've cleared him out so that the back rank checks would work. So if you want to look at this as a regular white to play and win problem, by the way, let's see how many answers there are. No, that's the only answer. So it turns out that this Jeff Coakley problem, and Jeff's an excellent problemist, would also serve as a white to play and win problem as well. So it's actually harder as a double whammy than it is as a white to play and win, I think. You know, I haven't even looked at this until the video as a white to play and win problem because I was trying to do it as the puzzle that Jeff presented. But as a play and win puzzle, it turns out it works as well. All right, so we did our four puzzles today. We did a traditional black to play and win. Then we did a, a is this move safe? Then we did a is the, what's the right plan from it's your move from Jeff Coakley. Then we did a, a puzzle from Winning Chess Puzzles for Kids. So we actually got four books. The Bain book, my book is your move safe, Ward's book, and Coakley's book. And we'll be leading on the, these and other authors in our video series uh, to try to give you some of their more interesting puzzles and puzzles where you can learn something. After all, the name of our video series is uh, is the Improve Your Chess. And when you do these various kinds of puzzles in the long run, it should improve your chess. All right, for ICC and Chess FM, I hope you enjoyed our new format. Let us know. We'll talk to you. See you next time. Bye.